Welcome. I'm Duke Crawford, lead pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church of Toledo. I want to thank you for taking the time to stream this service. What you're going to see is a basic worship service that we have week to week at Emmanuel Baptist Church. You're going to see that we sing as a congregation. Our songs are gospel-rich type songs. They're songs that really express who Jesus Christ is and what he came to do for us. And then you'll notice that as part of this service, really the, the main part of this service, we open the word of God. We believe God speaks to us today through his word. And so we want to open the word of God. We want to explain what the scripture says and then challenge each one to respond in faith and obedience to God's word. Now, we in no way want this to replace you being plugged into a local church. But if this can help you to change and grow, then we pray God's blessing upon you as you watch. Hey, praise the Lord. Let's take our Bibles and let's turn to 2 Corinthians this morning. We're, we're going to chapter 10 this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We've been going through this series of messages through this, this letter. Uh, we've entitled it, Written with Love. 2 Corinthians can be divided into three sections. Chapters 1 through 7 is the first section. Chapters 8 and 9 would be the second section. And then chapters 10 through 13 for the third section. Now we know that throughout this letter that Paul has been addressing uh, problems. That's why we would say the nature of this letter is polemic. When we say that, we mean that everything that's written, even things that are positive that are written, they're written in response to a, a problem. So when Paul says something as glorious as he, Christ, became sin, that we might know his righteousness, he who knew no sin became sin, that we might know and become his righteousness, that glorious positive truth comes as a result of a problem that he's addressing. So that's why we say it's polemic. And we know one of the problems he was addressing was that there were those who were seeking to tear his ministry apart, those who were uh, trying to undermine his apostolic authority. And Paul had been uh, apparently a pub publicly um, ridiculed and, and assaulted. And here Paul, who loved the church and loved the testimony of Jesus Christ, then is writing to confront these problems and writing to tell the church how they are to deal with not just the problems, but as we're going to see in this last section, the problem makers. Who is it that's responsible for that trouble? So the first seven chapters uh, are about dealing with these problems, but for the most part, it's, uh, it's somewhat upbeat. Chapter 7 ends very upbeat as it, it ends with Paul talking about the reconciliation that's come as a result of true repentance. Then the middle section, chapters 8 and 9, we just went over the last uh, four or five messages where Paul is dealing with the problem of the cirrhosis of the giver. Remember, they had promised that they were going to be part of a giving project. They, they had not done so yet, and so Paul writes those two chapters to encourage them to be generous. Now, we come to the third section. The third section is much like the first, although it's more direct. It's more specific. Paul's not just talking about problems, but he's talking about the problem makers and how they are to address these problem makers. That's why we're entitling this message and really the, the entry into this third and final section, the courage to resolve conflicts, the courage to resolve conflicts. Now, notice as we begin reading in chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians how Paul is dealing with those, beginning to deal with those, specifically dealing with those who are undermining his authority and ministry at the church at Corinth. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. Paul says, I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I'm away, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who respect who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. 
We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Let's pray as we look at God's Word. Gracious Father, we ask, Lord, for the help of the Spirit now as we try to understand this passage. There are some things that I believe are said sarcastically, and so, Lord, we're just praying that you would help us understand that so that we might understand what Paul is writing, what he intends by what he writes. And then, Father, we're praying that not only would you, would you help our minds, but that, Father, you would move in our hearts May this fall heavy on our hearts, Lord, as we consider the nature of the spiritual warfare that we all uh, are involved in. Father, may it fall heavy on our hearts when we see the need for, for discipline. And Father, may it also uh, teach and instruct us concerning the meekness and gentleness of Christ that even problems that need to be confronted must be confronted in the right way. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us see that as well. In all things, Lord, uh, even as we were singing, we want all glory to be to Christ. And so help us now as we turn to your word in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's talk about how to deal with conflict then from this passage. While we're talking specifically here about conflict in the church, there's certainly application that would deal with uh, conflict in the family, uh, conflict in parenting, conflict in marriage, conflict um, in, at the workplace. Uh, these are principles that would be applicable to any conflict that you might be involved in. So let's take a look at, at, at what Paul would tell us here concerning conflict. First of all, when, when we are dealing with conflict, we have to check our attitude. Number one, check your attitude. The attitude you bring to conflict matters, so check it. Let's be clear, when we talk about the courage to deal with conflict, that we're not talking about being rude and obnoxious and proud. The way we deal with conflict is very significant and very important. If we're going to resolve things in a way that pleases God, we have to check our attitude. Speaking the truth in love is still in the Bible. So that's really what we're talking about here with this first point. Check your attitude. Now, let's face it. If there's anyone who had reason to be hostile, it would be the Apostle Paul. If anyone had reason to be obnoxious, humanly speaking, it would be the Apostle Paul as he relates to not just the problem makers, but even to those who were listening to them. Because Paul had been lied about, criticized, publicly maligned, ridiculed, and slandered. And all of this in the presence of people he had won to Christ, people he had discipled. But notice how Paul begins this final section. Again, I, I would say, humanly speaking, and he would just want to take no prisoners both guns blazing. But notice how he begins. I, Paul, myself, entreat you. That word entreat basically means just to sit down and have a conversation. I want to just sit down and convert. I want to sit down and have a conversation. I want to sit down and talk with you about this. I entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He addresses the church with meekness and gentleness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's always appropriate, by the way. I mean, in any situation that you find yourself in and you're thinking, how should I respond in this? This is always appropriate. This always works. A good rule of life, when in doubt, act like Jesus. Follow Jesus. How would Jesus respond to this? And Jesus, who would not ignore problems, but would deal with the gentleness and meekness. When we talk about being gentle and meek, we're not talking about being weak and inept. Here Paul courageously is dealing with crisis, but he's doing so in a way that is shepherding the church through it with the gentleness and meekness of Jesus Christ. You and I don't naturally act this way. And that's why this is really 
uh, something supernatural that's born in our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit. That is the life and character of Jesus Christ. Now, the second part of verse 2 uh, might be kind of confusing to you. Um, notice what Paul says there when he says, I, or excuse me, the, this is the second part of verse 1. I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when away. Now, what does he mean by that? And this is a place where I think Paul is using sarcasm. Paul's opposition would accuse him of being bold when away. In other words, he's like bold when he writes his letters. Like 1 Corinthians, he deals with a lot of things, and he, he writes boldly when he's away. You know what that's like. You know what it's like to hunker down in the bunker of social media and lob, lob things out there at people, or to text, or to send your emails and hit send. <laughs> that will show them. So it's like in, in privacy, in, when you're not face-to-face -face with someone, you're bold as a lion. That's what Paul's critics were saying. He just... He's in these remote places writing these letters with boldness to you, but when he's in your presence, he's, he's like a pussycat. He's like a little kitty cat. So when Paul says that at the end of verse 1, it's like he's quoting. You could even think of quote marks around that. I, who am bold when away, and then mild and meek when in your presence. He's being sarcastic about that. That's what was being said about him. We know Paul uh, had, had confronted them publicly. He tells us back in chapter 2 that he had made that severe, hard, painful visit back to Corinth in which to confront the problems personally. So obviously we know that that was not true of the Apostle Paul. So notice two things going on here at once. It is both possible to confront problems, to be courageous in confronting problems, but to confront them with the meekness and gentleness of Christ. That's what we're talking about here. That's why we're saying check your attitude in conflict. The attitude you bring really matters. I hope we're all learning this. I hope we're all growing in this. Um, I remember a time, this was, this was a long time ago, and uh, not here, so it doesn't involve anyone you know, but there was this young couple in our church, and they were having problems, and, and to be quite honest with you, a lot of their problems had to do with the husband's immaturity. And I talked with them on, on several occasions, and um, one time the wife came to me in tears, and she told me some of the things her husband was saying and doing, not doing. And uh, I remember this. It was a Friday afternoon. I said, are you going to be home at 1 o'clock tomorrow, Saturday? He said, well, I think so. I said, make sure he's there. And I went over there, and I was just kind of loaded for bear. And I remember I went in and sat down with them. And I just, I let this guy have it. And what the, the problem was, and this is why I say I hope we're all learning in this, because we need to be courageous to confront problems. But I brought a wrecking ball to a restoration project. And that's not a good idea. And even in the, midst of, in the middle of our conversation, I had to stop and I just, I had to say, would you forgive me? I did not come here with a, an attitude of Christ. I didn't say with meekness and gentleness, but I could have. I could have said, I didn't come with meekness and gentleness in Christ. I brought a wrecking ball to a restoration project. Hope we're all learning this. Hope we're all growing in this. We're not saying avoid problems. Paul was courageous in confronting problems. It's just that he did so with the, the meekness, the gentleness of Christ. We need the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is something that must be born in our hearts as, as a result of the Spirit of God in us, producing in us the life of God and the character of Jesus. So check your attitude. Now, this would be good as place as any to stop and just talk a little bit about the opposition that Paul was facing in Corinth. I believe that the opposition could be put into two different camps, and I'm sure there was crossover between these two camps, but there's two basic camps. One of them would have a Greek or Gentile background. The other would have a Jewish background. One of the, one of the camps would be the sophists. The sophists. The sophists were a class of teachers in ancient Greece. They prided themselves in their technical and rhetorical skills and were known for their self-commendations and the exuberant prices they charged for their services. <laughs> 
Uh, D.A. Carson has written an excellent commentary on these last chapters of 2 Corinthians. And he writes this about these sophists. He says, sophists delighted to parade their accomplishments and display their oratory. They aimed to collect a growing number of disciples who hung on their words and paid large sums for the privilege of sitting at their feet. The more accomplished the sophist, the more he could boast and the greater charge he could levy. Sophisticated haughtiness, let's know that term, sophisticated haughtiness became a virtue and self-admiration a strength. He's describing these sophists. Now, as we read through and, and go through these last few chapters, will you keep that sophist in mind and, and how they were, what they value? You're going to see that Paul is specifically uh, dealing directly with those who thought in that way. If you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you know that this was the exact opposite of how he thought. Uh, you might just go back to, to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. While the sophists delighted in their rhetorical genius, while they delighted in their, their uh, ability to, to persuade people with their arguments, notice how Paul described his ministry when he went to Corinth. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, And I, when I come to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. You, you can hear he's, he's referring to these sophists. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God." You can just hear the sophist saying, Paul is so unimpressive. Why, his teaching is so worthless, he doesn't even charge for it. Now, in other passages, Paul said, as an apostle, I have the right to charge the church for my physical needs. But when he went to Corinth, he didn't even charge them anything. Why? Well, well not because that his message was meaningless or worthless, but because in that particular time, he believed that it was best that he not charge them for the ministry of the gospel. And so his opponents pointed to things like that and said, see, there's the evidence. Paul isn't near as sharp as you think he is. His teaching so worthless, he doesn't even charge people for it. Well, notice verse 2. Again, you can hear Paul dealing with these sophists who are in the background making their noise. He says in verse 2, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect, who suspect us. That word could also be like accuse us of walking according to the flesh, or as the NIV says, who think we live by the standards of the world. So the sophists judged Paul by their own worldly standards, and they mocked him and ridiculed him because they were fa he was found wanting of their standing according to their standards. So that was one of the categories of the opposition against Paul. It would be what we would, what are called sophist. The other would be Judaizers, and you're going to see in these chapters where there's times that he's specifically dealing with the Judaizers. He deals with them in other of his letters. Basically, a Judaizer believed this, that Jesus br brings us to God, but Moses brings you to Jesus. And so if you're going to get to God, you go to Moses, and then you go to Jesus, and Jesus will bring you to God. They were Judaizers. They were saying, especially to those of, of Gentile background, if you're going to be a follower of Christ, you have to first go through the law. And so they emphasize things like circumcision. They would emphasize the, the rituals and the practicing of holy days and so forth and so on. And th again, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you know that he was deathly opposed to that. Anything that added to the simple message of grace, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, crucified in your place and risen, and the work of Christ alone being your standing before God, the work of Christ alone being your righteousness, anything added to that, Paul was deathly opposed to. 
And so that's why he was so, so adamant against the Judaizers who were, in his mind, adding to the gospel. So you have those two categories, and as we go through these last few chapters, you'll see that there's different times that he's referencing one or the other. So the courage we need to confront issues is to be couched in Christ and the likeness and character of Christ and his meekness and gentleness. Now, let's talk about understanding the true nature of the conflict. We're talking about dealing with conflict. First of all, we have to check our own attitude that we bring to that conflict. But secondly, we need to understand the true nature of the conflict. What is the nature of the conflict? Is it like the sophist said? Is it a matter of rhetorical genius? Is it a matter of great stage presence? Is it a light and laser show? Is it about making it look good, interesting, entertaining? Well, let's see what Paul says about that. Go to verse 3. For though he says, see, so remember, he's, he's, he has those who are trying to judge him and compare him to their own earthly standards. And so he says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, these are some of the most significant verses in all of the New Testament, specifically about spiritual warfare. These are what I would call standalone verses, meaning just these verses in themselves. And, of course, it, it's, it's dangerous, wrong to take them out of their context. That's why we're looking at them this morning in their context. But standalone verses, you can take just these verses and from them build a philosophical foundation for ministry. Like ministry like, like we believe in, biblical counseling. If you were to ask, why do we do biblical counseling at Emmanuel? Because of what these three verses teach. That's why we do biblical counseling. We do biblical counseling and we minister the word of God because of the nature of the spiritual warfare in which we are part of. So we're going to double back on these verses in two weeks. Next week, as I said, will be the message on the prodigal son, but we're going to double back in two weeks and come back to these verses and talk about them just alone and the nature of the spiritual warfare and battle that we fight. Now, some of you are, uh, have been around long enough to remember back in the 90s, there were a series of books that were written back in the 90s. They were novels, but they still had as their, their point to, make, uh, to teach theology and to teach the nature of spiritual warfare. And they were very exciting books. They were very well-written books. But they, they basically portrayed spiritual warfare as uh, this cosmic battle back and forth. And there's a demon behind every car. And you need good angels to battle for you on your side. And it's back and forth. I mean, it was all very vivid, all very, uh, very well-written and everything. But really has nothing to do with the spiritual battle that the Apostle Paul describes in these verses. That's why it's so important for us to understand the nature of of spiritual warfare, and that's what these verses are dealing with. Now, looking at them, though, in the context of what Paul is saying in confronting these problems, Paul is, in essence, saying we're judged all day long according to worldly standards, but those judgments miss the real point. What is the real point? Well, he's going to use here a very vivid metaphor that illustrates true spiritual warfare. Let's talk about the, the metaphor to begin with. Metaphors of ancient warfare. And um, you can picture in your mind a conquering king who has his mighty army and he lays siege to a city. And his army is very powerful and so they, as they fight the city, they breach the wall of the city. And as they breach the wall of the city, the army that's inside the city that's trying to defend the city, they retreat back to the keep or the stronghold. You Tolkien fans right now are thinking of Helm's Deep. Admit it. You're thinking of Helm's Deep. You remember Helm's Deep where they, they go back into the keep. They go back into the stronghold because that's like the, the last place of defense in order to keep the city. Well, if the army is strong enough, they they tear down the stronghold. And when they tear down the stronghold, they conquer the city, they conquer this army, and then 
the, the uh, combatants of this army are brought before the king and he sh- draws his sword and he determines whether or not they live or die. That's the very graphic metaphor that the Apostle Paul here is using when he talks about this spiritual warfare. Now, how, what does he mean by it, though? What is exactly he illustrating by this? Well, let's break it down and think of it part by part. First of all, clearly Jesus is the conquering king. So when we think about this ancient metaphor and this powerful army is being led by a king, Christ is the powerful king that is leading his army. Notice what the greatest problem is. I mean, what, what's the problem in all this spiritual battle? What's, what's the danger of losing it? What's at, 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 uh, uh, what's at play here? What's, what's the cost? It's the knowledge of God. That's what Paul says all of this is against. The spiritual warfare is all being waged against the knowledge of God, against the knowledge of Jesus Christ, against the word of Christ. So Jesus Christ is the conquering king. Our thoughts, our beliefs, our affections, our very worship is to be brought in surrender to Jesus. Without the truth, people can't know God. That's what Paul's getting at here. So we see in this metaphor, Jesus, of course, is the conquering king. What about the weapons, though? Paul says this in the negative. He says that our weapons are not of the flesh. They're not merely physical. They're not lights and lasers. They're not just rhetorical skills or slick marketing. But he says this, they are divine power. They have divine power to tear down strongholds. Now here Paul doesn't mention specifically what these weapons are other than those two references, the negative and the positive. But if we go to Ephesians chapter 6, here Paul spells out specifically what the weapons are in this warfare. This is Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic power over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and the shoes on your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, taking up the shield of faith with which we can extinguish the firing darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that the words may be given to me in the opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in the chains that I declare boldly as I ought to speak. There's the weapons of our warfare. You know, as you study those things out, it's very interesting to see that almost all of that armor is made uh, referenced by Isaiah or some other Old Testament writer, and it's in reference to Christ. In reality, this armor that we put on is the character of Jesus Christ. We put on the armor of Jesus Christ using the weapons of the sword of truth and prayer. Why? Because that's the nature of the battle in which we are involved That's why we need spiritual weapons. Number three, let's talk about strongholds for a moment. Paul says that these strongholds are any thoughts or beliefs or arguments, or as he says here in the ESV translated, lofty opinion that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. I think we could think of these strongholds in two categories. They're both external and they're internal. External strongholds would be all the ologies and isms, theology, philosophy, psychology, all the ologies and the isms like materialism and hedonism and Marxism and Buddhism and capitalism, all the isms. So strongholds would be both um, ologies and isms, which by the aren't necessarily right or wrong, 
but those would be the, what, what's going on in the inner person, what's going on in our thoughts, the things that we're believing, the things that we're, the worldviews in which we're basing our lives on. So external meaning that these are, these are strongholds outside us. Internally, then, would be the thoughts and meditations of the heart, would be things like fear and anxiety and lust, or thanksgiving and praise. So it's, it's, it's getting at our belief system. It's getting at the things that we value, what we believe, what we treasure. Now, let's talk about the fourth part of this spiritual battle, and that is Christ's word determines whether it lives or dies. Christ's word determines whether... Now, again, in the metaphor, the stronghold might mean something negative, but obviously our thoughts, there's, there's both negative and there's also that's what's, what's good, what's positive. But ha- now we're talking about what determines, though, whether it's true or false, whether it's good or bad, whether it's right or wrong, is the word of Christ. Christ is the one who determines whether it lives or dies. Does it glorify God? If it does, it lives. If it fosters a knowledge of God, it lives. If it brings people to Christ, it lives. If it's insight into true worship, it lives. But if it sets itself against the knowledge of God, then it must go. It must die. Christ's word determines whether something is good or bad, whether it's true or false, right or wrong. Therefore, Let's think about then how Paul would have thought about this then in regard to his life and ministry, in regards to the church at Corinth, as we think about it even in regards to our own lives in church. Paul didn't fall prey to the thinking of the sophist. He didn't say, well, maybe those guys are right. Maybe I need a better way to package this message. Maybe I need a better message after all. Instead, he proclaimed the word of Christ and turned his teaching and preaching against anything that would set itself up against the knowledge of God. Think about how easy it is really to abandon the word of Christ and just to settle for what seems to work. Just to settle for what seems to to work in drawing a crowd, what seems to work in that it doesn't put people off. But Paul says, no, he, he doesn't fall for that. But instead, he realizes that it's the word of Christ, it is the word of truth, is what must be waged when we think about spiritual warfare. Listen, we give thoughts to things, certainly. We give thoughts to things that are physical, that are worldly, certainly we do. You've noticed that we have our Sunday morning worship service at 10.30 on Sunday morning, not at 5.30. Why do we do that? Well, because it's more convenient. Now, some of you would love the 5.30 admit it. But it's, it's more convenient that way. So it's, again, we don't, it's not that we don't give thought to things like that. It's not that we don't give thought e- even in, um, in, in presenting a message. I try to practice what I preach anyway, and that I go over my notes. I try to write some things down so that they're, they're said with a certain amount of precision or whatever. I mean, I work at that. So it's not that we're saying that we don't give any thought to anything like that at all. Um, It's just that we don't love or trust those things. We love and trust the Word of God. We love and trust the Word of Christ. That's what we believe in. That's what we bank on. When we think about doing the work of the church, we realize it's not just in the pastor having excellent rhetorical skills. It is in the power of the Word of God falling heavy on the hearts of people. That's our confidence. That's our trust. That's how we do spiritual battle. We realize the conflict isn't just outward or physical, but it's spiritual. And not just spiritual, but what is spiritually true and right and good. And that which deals with the issues of the heart and which leads to the knowledge of God. Let's be committed to that. It's amazing when you you look at history, the greatest revival, I talked about this a couple weeks ago, the greatest revival that ever came to this continent, we know it as, as the Great Awakening. And there's two primary preachers that are looked at in the Great Awakening. One of them 
was a man who was very gifted in his rhetorical skills. George Whitfield. I mean, he was a powerful, powerful preacher. And God used him to preach the word. But it was more like sort of um, a traveling itinerant type of ministry. But then there was another individual who was more of a pastoral writing kind of ministry. And that, of course, was Jonathan Edwards. And it's really amazing when you read about Jonathan Edwards, he did not have rhetorical skills. He was tall and skinny, had bad eyesight, big, thick glasses. He would manuscript all of his sermons, and he would write them out, and he would read them in a high, squeaky voice. But the power of the truth that those words contained was, was a power that laid heavy on the hearts of people, and there was true revival that came across the colonial America as a result of the, the preaching and writing of Jonathan Edwards. God used both. He used a man that was, was skilled in rhetoric. He used a man who was skilled in writing and in his thinking. And we need both. But the bottom line is God used both, and what was most significant in both was the power of the gospel in which they preached. Now, let's just talk about this thirdly. When we're talking about solving problems or confronting problems, we need to check our attitude. We need to understand the true nature of those problems so that we don't get sidetracked into things that do not help in true spiritual warfare. And then number three, we need to be willing to use discipline. Notice verse 6 again. Paul says, being ready speaking to the church, to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. In other words, Paul says, when I get there, when I come to see you, I'm going to be ready to deal with discipline any disobedience that remains, assuming the fact that they're going to be doing their job in obeying his words now in dealing with the false teachers and the problems that were in the church. You know, different situations call for different kinds of spiritual care. The same way it is with medicine. I've only spent one short time in the hospital. I was in the hospital for three days when I was in college, and I got this uh, infection on my elbow. And instead of caring for it, uh, I played football. And, you know, actually, it was, the, it was the dorm championship. I mean, I couldn't miss it. And I, I smashed my elbow on the ground a lot of times, and just like a couple days after that, my elbow just puffed up. It was all red and infected. And told my mom about it. She says, you need to get to the doctor. So I went to the doctor. Bottom line is I ended up in the hospital getting an IV and, and getting this, this cleaned out. But while I was in the hospital, and you've been in the hospital too, where, one of the things that makes a hospital stay, uh, whether it's positive or, or negative for you, is the care you get from nurses. They, they, they nurse, they help, they, they're, they're oftentimes very kind, and, and uh, they, they nurse you. They nurse you through what your problem is. And sometimes that's the kind of spiritual care that you need. Listen, other times you need a surgeon. If your appendix goes bad, you don't want to just be nursed. You don't want someone just to hold your hands and say, here, take some pain relievers. Don't worry, it will only rupture. That's, that's not the care you want. You need a surgeon, don't you? You need a surgeon who will remove the problem. And what Paul is saying here to the church is, in essence, the care you need is not just the care of a nurse. You need the care of a surgeon. There are those false teachers who need to be removed. They need to be disciplined. So there must be a willingness to discipline. Paul is exhorting the church to be willing to practice the discipline of Matthew 18 and of 1 Corinthians 5. Sometimes discipline can be remedial. We pray that. We want that. But whether it is or not, it still must not keep us from practicing discipline when, the, when that's the care that's needed for the glory of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. I think it's, it's pretty clear that we live in a day that lacks discipline. Discipline is lacking in the home. Discipline is lacking in schools, disciplines lacking in, in communities, lack of discipline. And uh, Paul would be calling us to say there are times, certainly which things should be cared for as a nurse, but there's also times in which you need the care of a surgeon and you need to be willing to practice discipline. That's why I encourage uh, 
you to come to the parenting teaching that we'll have this Friday night, Saturday morning, and see what godly biblical parenting and discipline, what that looks like. But it's needed. It's absolutely needed. So a willingness to use discipline is one means in which problems can be solved. What's the conflicts that you might be facing today? You might be facing some personal conflicts. I want to encourage you to know that Jesus Christ, as the good shepherd, ministers to us in meekness and gentleness. I'm so thankful for that. You know, when we think about giving care to one another, we need to give that care with a meekness and a gentleness, even when it's discipline. Understand that the true nature of the conflict that you're, that you're experiencing is an inner man uh, conflict. And so therefore, it's, it's, going to be, it's not just going to be techniques that will solve it. It's going to be the truth of God's Word. It's going to be prayer. It's going to be that which is of a spiritual nature. And with these conflicts that you're experiencing, some of them may be things that you need to, to seek the help of others. You may, to, may need to take more aggressive action than what you are taking now to address those problems. You need to be willing to do that. Maybe you have a relational problems. You need to go back to this text. Look at the attitude. Check the attitude that you bring in those relational conflicts. Understand the true nature of them. Again, it's not just a matter of, of technique, but of the truth. Dealing with the heart with the word and always be willing to take the action that needs to be taken even if it's even if it's discipline that discipline again can be remedial it needs to be done in a way that's with the meekness and gentleness of christ but we can't just ignore problems and expect them to get better we need to follow what the apostle paul lays out for us in this text let's pray and ask god's help to do that